haven't had a chance to really practice a lot, so forgive me for just staring at the piece of paper and coming kind of into words and justice here. Uh, I'm a software guy, not a hardware guy. <laughs> so, um, he was my dad. For many fathers and sons, that statement would imply tension, conflict, and disappointment. But it wasn't like that between us. We never dangled. I loved him, he loved me, and we both knew it. The only time I ever remember my dad getting angry at me was when I was very young, and I think it was more due to shock or something I did innocently than any real anger. My dad always had time for me when I was growing up, and he was always happy to see me. And I came by for a visit later in life. And I know he was very proud of me. He never pushed me in any particular direction, instead choosing to support whatever I did, even if he didn't understand it, or made him nervous, which happened quite often as I moved away from the academic life he knew into the world of business. He never hid his concerns for me, but he always knew it was my choice to make. And in the ultimate mark of love, some of my choices got me in trouble, or I needed help, he gave that help without hesitation and without criticism. How many sons can say that about their dads? My dad wasn't some kind of saint or superhero. He was just one of the most decent people I've ever known. As near as I can tell, he treated other people with the same respect he treated me. He had a very clear sense of what he believed to be right or wrong, and was remarkably consistent in living by those principles. But he didn't use his convictions as a club to beat other people with. He was just a thoroughly decent person. As a kid, both my parents showed enormous trust that I would never abuse the great amount of freedom they gave me, and I never felt the need to test their tolerance. They set an example of what decency was and believed they could trust their children to follow their examples. Other parents could learn from this. Despite his strongly moral nature, my dad was not uptight. As many of you know, he had an absolutely irrepressible sense of humor. Meals in our house were always filled with laughter and joking. And as I was going through all the photos of him put together in the mortal display over there, I was struck over and over again by how so many photos showed him laughing or obviously relaxing and having fun. How many people would be comfortable having their picture taken sitting on the deck in their pajamas? <laughs> he was that kind of person. I was really lucky to get a chance to know my dad all over again later in life as an adult when my wife Susan and I had a rough patch and ended up living with mom and dad for two years. The four of us lived in very close quarters and the arrangement was always easy and friction free. We shared meals, watched TV together, and my mom and dad even welcomed our dog Luba with us. This from a family that just could not deal with pets when I was growing up. <laughs> How many sons could move back into the family home in their 30s with a wife and dog in tow and everyone enjoy every minute of it? And ever since then, when me and Susan stopped by for a visit, he would greet us at the door with a happy shout of, It's the kids! <laughs> I feel incredibly lucky to have had a dad like him. And I would miss him enormously. <laughs> yes.
I thank God for living in a lot of places. Then I lived for extended periods in six different nations besides the USA. China, Lebanon, Bangladesh, then East Pakistan, Chile, Switzerland, and Canada. To use each as a base for us to explore the surrounding parts of the world. When living in Beirut, Beirut, he took a three month honeymoon with my mom in Africa, seeing the pyramids and King Tut's tomb back in the late 50s, and went in by himself with a guy with a curacy lantern down into the tomb. The Serengeti's vast herds of the beast. From Shanghai, he visited Tibet and the Great Wall. There's a picture of him in front of the Great Wall up there in the, in the foyer. <laughs> He relocated when he was in Shanghai, he relocated the town he lived in as a child in inland China. Very hard to get to. He found an old man there that remembered his dad. Uh, remembered his dad, Jesse, from 50 years earlier. <clears throat> from um, Dhaka in uh, East Pakistan, he visited India. From Santiago, Chile, where we lived as a family, we took our family on weekend expert excursions, exploring up in the high Andes. From Geneva, we explored the Alps and we made trips to Paris and to the, the south of France. My brother and I were already having bird watchers at that point, and I had some of my dad saying, We're out here in the Alps, and you want to do some marsh? <laughs> This is the other places he saw in his travels, and included the, the pyramids and Teotihuacan you know, and the Yucatan in Mexico, and Puerto Vallarta, and Trinidad and Tobago, Quito and Ecuador, England and Scotland, Norway, Sweden, Belgium, and the Netherlands, Spain and the Alhambra, Syria, Yugoslavia. My mom was just reminded me of a story when they were in the VW bug. This is uh, before they had kids and they were they all lost them. That was in Yugoslavia and they got to the end of the dirt road in their bug and they couldn't turn around, they couldn't go back. And it was at night and all the villagers came out and the men lifted the VW bug, turned it around and went back in the direction. And I was having another jam. I think there's a picture of that bug. They went through Greece, and my dad even kind of music had me do with the call at a professional meeting. She stayed that for a while. And I'm sure I've heard any other places he went to, and probably more that I've never heard the tales of. Um, within the United States, he can live in places as varied as here in Amherst and um, downtown Manhattan, right out of City Park, uh, off of uh, Central Park, uh, Washington, D.C., metro area, Seattle. Spokane, where he got his two different masters, two different masters graduate degrees, and in South Dakota. Um, during the other two decades of, of visiting me in New Orleans, I like to think he got familiar with the heart and soul of Big Easy and our and any sort of celebration of life there, right? And he had such a rich life in terms of everything he was able to experience. Um, he wrote books that he saw published. And I like one of them still going into more editions. He had an occupation that he could indulge his curiosity in about things he found interesting in. That's the great benefit of academia, it's like the best job in the world, really, right? For that reason. And he found a woman who became a soulmate. And it's to be in here over 50 years. And you got to see both the sons grow up to produce to productive adulthood and, and also find the women of our own. And for the last decade, you got to know the dogs of his grandchildren, who also adore him. He owned an architecturally acclaimed cottage in Nova Scotia, a person of love overlooking an amazing blue view of this shocking blue bay. Um, he and mom spent two to three months there every summer for decades escaping the heat of Amherst. 
deep south, I say that with some amusement. And they developed uh, relationships with the local fishermen in the area, would bring lobsters to their and stuff when they arrived. Um, I went and looked back at my dad's life and I recognized how much living he really squeezed into it. But in addition to the joy that comes from seeing that his life was one that was fully lived, I believe we can also see that his life, this is a life that is still ongoing. Um, this revelation has crystallized in my heart with his passing, bringing to focus something that I've begun to learn by watching my own kids grow and seeing how they are becoming a continuation of me. Um, in the same way I am, who I, who I am is largely traceable to my dad. It is as if parts of him are moving on to me. I used to think that statements by the grieving, that they knew their loved one was invisibly still with them or moving on in their heart, were mere coping mechanisms of the bereaved. Not really bearing any substance, but now, now I can see that there really is something to that. And, and that is even something profound. We all become like our parents in many ways. Most of them picked up subconsciously by osmosis. I've come to realize that large parts of who I am can be directly traced to my dad. Because my dad traveled widely and took us to many places as a family, my own horizon today is global and not just local. As my dad, when I'm on an adventure, I don't really go to a different state, I go to a different continent. Right? Because that was how it was, that was what I saw growing up. Right? That was what they alive. Because my dad had a PhD, there was never an educational ceiling over my head. Right? I've always assumed that I could succeed educationally, and I don't think anyone who I chose. And you know, being a college professor now, I can see that that's not something to take for granted. There are lots and lots of college students who, who see that, you know, don't think they can go higher than a bachelor's degree. Yeah. But that was even a question for me because my dad already had a PhD. Yeah. So it was a given that that was something that was a possibility for me as well. Um, because my dad was a thinking person, I grew up with an inquisitive mind and a desire to learn as much as I could. Right? You know, my, my parents didn't listen to five minute news broadcasts, they listened to NPR, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, the point is, you know, the NPR is obviously a very thinking channel, right? It's very deep. And so, uh, I grew up that way too. Learning things new today, and learning new things today is still one of the aspects of life that gives me the most pleasure. The joy of learning that he, my dad imparted to me continues to be a, a major positive in my life and gives me a buzz almost every day of learning something new and fascinating. I, I consume information, right? And that, that daily pleasure is there because of my dad in part. It was passed down from him by example. I hide it from him, as it were. Um, because my dad had a strong moral compass and expected a lot of himself ethically, I also had a deep ingrained desire to do the ethically right thing just because it's right. Although we did not attend church, upon my coming to faith in Jesus at age 19, I found that many components of the Christian lifestyle were already part of my basic instincts, just because of the way things have been shaped by watching my father and my mother in our home. Um, and then there's Bourbon. Um, he was initially my father, which maybe you know not, a passionate bird, bird washer. Uh, he was initially my father who brought that interest into our family, and they were supported by my brother, and passed on to me. And that also guided me to my ultimate career path in that field, alerting me to the unconventional solutions of academic geography as a way of overcoming the very High job market in ornithology. But when I am, was, got my bachelor's degree in biology and I was scoping out ways to develop a career working with birds, um, you know, the job market in biology was saturated. People were having a postdoc for five or ten years to really get an academic position. And, um, and my dad, who was a geography professor, went to Wilkie at UMass, 
please can you go talk to this guy? And he helped me carve out of a scheme, basically, for making an end run around the system, <laughs> getting a, a job studying birds in a geography program, which the balance of supply and demand of PhDs is much more reasonable. Right? And so that's the, the tack I took. And, and it paid off. Right? So that uh, overcame that very top pipe job market in ornithology. So each time I notice a bird, which is a lot, you know, my guess your influence is manifest there in my life as well. Um, my father has always been a devoted husband, and this has rubbed off on me too, just as I've seen him love and care for my mom over five decades. I also see marriage as lifelong. It's not something I have to think about, it's just the way I program, right? Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is this, a whole lot of content of my life and my personality, including some of the things that give me the greatest sense of, of personal dignity and self-worth, and also some of the greatest, my greatest sources of joy are things that I acquired from my dad. In this sense, he really is still with me and will be present with me the rest of my life. And it really is hard for me to imagine any gift that could be greater than that. David wrote a memoir of his life. It was 
for his eyes only. He faced himself and took stock. He did share a few revelations with us. Some of these were confessions of hidden parts of his life. Some were simply conclusions he had come to. David's style was sparse, even spare. His emails to me were signed simply, David. They said only what needed to be said and had a quality of calligraphy. Only essence reached the page. Likewise, David's photographs. Each year a Christmas card would arrive with one carefully selected image that conveyed a great deal. Having grown up in a family of idealists for whom the hope of a positive possibility burned bright, David was the rebel in the family. I think he would describe himself as a realist. He insisted on looking at the evidence of what is, even when those facts were difficult. The starkness, starkness of his style was relieved by a lot of the light in his own and other people's foibles. David was conscientious. He held himself to a high standard. I'm sure his students at UMass received well-prepared material in his sociology classes. I know he was disgusted when they did not return the paper. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, we spoke recently to a former graduate student of David's. She, he was her dissertation advisor. She glowed as she recalled the experience, now many years past. Over the years, I watched the edges, and there were some edges, of David's character soften. His kindness deepened, his patience lengthened, and his devotion to Barbara their sons and their families were evident to all. A sweetness emerged that flavored times shared within an aroma of appreciation. David was, to me, a maverick of sorts. He made his own path professionally and personally. He viewed the world through a sharp-eyed lens. I shall miss the acuity of his perception keen mind housed in a long, lean body that was uniquely dated. His departure from planet Earth is painful only because we loved him so much. It reaches into the marrow of my bones.